Bonjour. Hi, I'm Jean-Christophe Guillaume, creative director for Prince of Persia 2. For 10 years, the Prince of Persia brand has been a defining benchmark for action-adventure gaming. So when we started imagining potential concepts for the sequel, we wanted to keep the best of the sands of time design, but also innovate to make the experience even more memorable. So, the concept behind POP 2 relies on the same core values as all of the other Prince of Persia games. A very organic design that makes the experience highly immersive. Outstanding controls and animations, and a mix of combat and exploration driven by an intense story. Indeed, in this genre, the player's experience is depending on the quality of the storytelling. Here, we want to put the player in a highly dramatic situation. His fate has been written, his fight is hopeless, he will die. That said, there will be a lot of unexpected developments as the game progresses. We've incorporated some special surprises guaranteed to throw gamers through a loop. To add to this drama and support this story, we also defined characters that we wanted to be absolutely memorable. For instance, players will fight enemies as diverse as the Thrall, a 20-foot giant, and a huge mythical animal called the Griffin. He'll also be hunted by the Dahaka, the guardian of time that can't be defeated. As many enemies, as many gameplays was our motto. Gameplays in Pop 2 will be even more diverse than in the previous episodes. We put a lot of creative efforts into defining new enigmas, new traps, and other elements that will keep gamers on the edge of their seats with every new challenge. But the major change in terms of gameplay is certainly the brand new fighting system. The team has completely reworked the way fights are organized in Pop 2. The player will not only be able to perform new moves like grabs, decapitations, and strangulations, but he'll also be able to create unique fight sequences by chaining a lot of basic moves together. We call it the free-form fighting system. Concretely, you will be able to start with a grab and then decide whether you want to throw the enemy at another one, slice him, strangulate him, or stab a sword through his body. Another thing we introduced is the double sword combat gameplay. Pick any weapon dropped by your enemy and use it as a secondary weapon. You now have access to a series of new deadly moves with two weapons. Or you can utilize the new projectile aspect of freeform fighting and simply throw it at your enemy for maximum damage. We also wanted to give game players a new sense of power. The Prince is now acting with more strength and aggressivity. We paid special attention to the diversity and visual impact of the finishing moves. For instance, the double sword decapitation. For this move, we put a lot of effort into the richness of the animations, special effects like slow motion and camera angles to make it absolutely memorable. Eventually, we wanted combats in Pop 2 to be as acrobatic as the best cloak and dagger movies. So we used these references to create unique moves using the environment, like swinging around a pillar while slicing your enemies, stabbing your sword in a curtain and sliding down, or rebounding off walls towards your enemy. With all these new elements, we strongly believe the sequel we all imagined and hoped for is coming to fruition, and it will truly set new standards in the action genre, just like Prince of Persia Sands of Time did in 2003. Prince of Persia 2 will hit stores this November. Look for it. Since the beginning of the conception phase of POP 2, our ambition has been to push the visual and graphic limits of the critically acclaimed The Sands of Time. The artistic direction and graphical treatment was one of the most prized features of The Sands of Time, and the massive challenge we face in POP 2 will be to innovate and provide an even more exciting and unique graphical treatment. First, we started by defining the new emotion that we wanted the player to feel in POP 2 namely fear and oppression. The player will play a prince that is cursed and that will have to face his own destiny, his own death. In this respect, the artistic direction took on a more mature and darker treatment. Visually, I wanted to place the emphasis on a realistic treatment in order for the players to be totally captivated by the game. In order to immerse the player in the game, we had to focus on color, light, textures, and detail in a unique and very specific way. I love the use of a monochromatic palette. 
It helped us to build the consistency throughout the game levels. It also helped us to provide emotions and also subtly put forward the key gameplay and plot elements. Each place in the game has a unique and dramatic mood and atmosphere that will help the player to orient himself. A game like Prince of Persia 2 allows each artist in our team to express themselves in very diverse universes. The player will explore a lot of various places, but they will first and foremost travel in different time periods, the past and the present. As for the characters, we had two challenges. First, we had to give the prince a new charisma, an attitude corresponding to his new combat abilities, with one constraint though, make him consistent with the prince of the sands of time. We eventually made him evolve. Our new prince is a more mature character, darker, and always ready for a fight. He's now a real warrior, very self-confident, but also marked by fate. He is cursed by what is hunting him, by a death he knows can't be avoided. We wanted his armor to reflect this new orientation, with leather armor close to his body that would both protect him and also allow him to perform masterful acrobatic moves. The player will feel this character's rage, a certain violence in his attacks, and an enormous determination to face his destiny. As for the enemies, we wanted them to reflect this new direction of the game. We wanted them to appear fierce and frightening and show attitudes and moves as distinctive as possible. As artistic director, I helped to unify the vision of the team to make one of the most visually stunning games of 2004. Once upon a time, there was a boy. I loved animated movies from an early age, and I sort of dreamed of making my own comic books or animated movies uh, when I'd grow up. Who wanted to tell stories a whole new way. Jordan was a master in game design. He rotoscoped his brother's movements. And created a tale of a prince. Jordan managed to create such deep emotions that ushered in a new age of gaming. Prince of Persia is also kind of considered one of the first action-adventure games. Sands of Time, unfortunately, it didn't really translate into the blockbuster sales that was expected. This is the story of the Prince of Persia series. At a young age, Jordan Mechner discovers what will become his lifetime passion. I loved animated movies from an early age, and I sort of dreamed of making my own comic books or animated movies uh, when I'd grow up. In 1979, a new computer from Apple gives him a chance to make his dreams a reality. When I was in high school, uh, the Apple II computer was invented, and to me that was just the coolest way of uh, telling a story on screen you know, that I could actually do at home without any special skills. It was beyond my means to do an animated movie or a live-action movie that would be any good. But I could do a computer game that would be pretty good. Within that, create a story in a world that the people who played the game could then experience and enjoy. His interest in creating games and storytelling carries over into college. I went to Yale in New Haven, Connecticut, and uh, ended up majoring in psychology. But mostly what I did during my four years of college was uh, go to the movies and uh, program computer games, which uh, really cut into studying and so forth. It's not long before Mechner's talents are discovered by a publisher called Broderbund. Broderbund was probably the biggest software company of that time. And uh, I mean, they were publishing all kinds of games. 
So if you're a game maker at that time, I mean, being hooked up with Broderbun was a pretty significant deal. While still a college student, Mechner goes to work on his first game for Broderbund. My first game, Karetica, one of the things that uh, inspired it were the film studies classes that I was taking at the same time. It seemed to me that uh, games were kind of at a stage where silent films had been at, at the turn of the century. For that reason, Karetica was structured very much like a silent movie. And there were a lot of technical limitations that games had at that time, which silent movies also had. Characters couldn't talk. You couldn't really move the camera. Karataka comes out for the Apple II in 1984. It sells 500,000 copies. During my senior year, Karataka was published and did very well. So when I graduated, instead of getting a regular job as most of my friends did, I thought, well, I'll just do another computer game. Mechner graduates in 1985. One year later, he begins work on a new project. He finds inspiration in a famous silver screen archaeologist. There's a scene in the first 10 minutes of Raiders of the Lost Ark where Indiana Jones is running towards the ledge. He jumps and he misses it, but he grabs on. He grabs a root, you know, and he pulls himself up and rolls under the gate just as it's closing. I mean, that kind of suspense, you know, I wanted to get that into a game. Mechner wants to combine the feel of a movie he loves with an Arabian setting similar to A Thousand and One Nights. The result is a 2D action adventure game called Prince of Persia. In many ways, Prince of Persia is kind of like a sequel to Karateka. Prince of Persia took the same fluid animation and very simple emotional melodramatic story and combined it with kind of a modular traps based environment. His whole view of the thing was to really incorporate a story into the gameplay rather than, you know, stopping the game and then showing some story and then continuing with the story. He really wanted to roll that all into one thing. The challenges of making a game like Prince of Persia are daunting, but Mechner is determined to bring his vision to life. By 1986, Jordan Mechner is living in California and working hard on his newest game, Prince of Persia. Like many developers of his time, he must wrestle with limited technology. One of the biggest limitations in the earlier stuff is definitely sound. You hear about composers making music for systems in that era, and it was really like composing with one hand tied behind your back. Well, the big problem on the Apple II with music was that the computer was only capable of playing one note at a time. My dad is a, you know, trained as a classical pianist when he was young, so I asked my dad if he would compose the music. First for Karateka, and then for Prince of Persia. Mechner uses a new technique in animation with the help of his 15-year-old brother, David. Jordan Mechner apparently took a lot of video footage of his brother jumping up and down and running around, hanging on ledges. After that, he basically was called uh, rotoscoping, and he rotoscoped his brother's movements. And he really studied that very, very hard and tried to really emulate almost perfectly his brother's movements. I wanted to create a character that would have weight. When you were running, you had momentum, and if you then pushed the joystick in the other direction to turn around, the character's arm would kind of flail behind him because it's hard to turn around when you're running that fast in one direction. The whole breakthrough in terms of uh, technology, which is the uh, rotoscope, helped everyone to gather around this magnificent character who was the very first one to be so well animated. As Prince of Persia gets closer to completion, Mechner's talents become more and more apparent. Jordan was a master in game design, level design ingredients, building the right learning curve, the right difficulty curve. The time limit on uh, Prince of Persia is what kind of heightened the whole experience of the game. You're sweating, you're wondering if you're gonna make it or not. You have no weapon and you gotta find the weapon. Clock's still ticking. The whole time the game has this incredible tension. The most appealing thing was how simple all the elements that Jordan managed to bring together to create such deep emotions. 
And the AI of the enemies was also pretty advanced for a game like that. I mean, you were out in a full-out sword battle with these guys. It wasn't just like hack slash and then they're out of your way. You engaged in kind of a lengthy sword battle with these guys and hope to put them away just in time for you to keep going. Broderbun releases Prince of Persia for the Apple II in 1989. It's funny, the big worry with Prince of Persia 1 was because I programmed it on the Apple II, and when it came out in 89, the Macintosh had already been introduced. It didn't seem like very many consumers were ever going to see it, simply because Apple II games weren't really being bought in stores anymore. What really saved Prince of Persia was the console versions that came out in the following years. The first Prince of Persia game is a huge success, not only because it created a palette for the rest of the video game industry to work off of, but also it was ported to so many different systems and there were people playing that all over the place. Prince of Persia will go on to sell two million copies. Meanwhile, Mechner decides to take a break. And at that point, I'd spent a good part of my youth writing computer games, and I was kind of eager to get out and experience the world and have adventures and so forth uh, outside of the industrial park in Northern California, where it seemed like I'd been forever. So I went back to New York, went to film school, then I lived in Paris to make a film. But he doesn't step out of games completely. When Bertrand came to me, come to me wanted me to do Prince of Persia 2. My first reaction was, no, I don't want to program another game. It's too hard. It takes too long. We were able to work out a, uh, an arrangement whereby I didn't have to program it. I would just come up with a story. I would do storyboards, and then they had their own team of engineers and artists who would do what I saw as the hard work, which I had had to do on Prince of Persia 1. So this was great, because I was actually living in Paris, and I was able to send back and forth you know, everything they needed to keep working on the game. Mechner spends the next four years shooting a short film and working on a sequel to Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia, The Shadow and the Flame comes out for the PC in 1993 and outsells the original. In 1997, Mechner branches out and releases an adventure game called The Last Express. The game is praised by critics, but sales are sluggish. So it was kind of this uh, bizarre labor of love this project that took us four years to do. And ultimately, there was not a huge market for adventure games in 97, especially adventure games that uh, took place in 1914 on the Orient Express. The game is beautiful. I love the project. Uh, I think all of us who worked on it are very proud of it. But it didn't have the kind of success that uh, the Prince of Persia games did. With the disappointing performance of The Last Express, Mechner feels like he's done with games. On September 17, 1999, Red Orb Entertainment releases Prince of Persia 3D for the PC. A Dreamcast port is also made, called Prince of Persia Arabian Nights. Mechner's involvement with the games is minimal. I went on from Last Express to write movie screenplays. I did a little consulting for them on the project at the beginning, but ultimately that was a Bertrand project that later became a Mattel project. Well, Prince of Persia 3D kind of came out under the radar. Nobody really paid that much attention to it. Mechner decides to take another break from the game industry Traitor! to make a documentary. I took a few years off uh, from making video games and focused on my other love, which is film. The project was a documentary about a neighborhood of Los Angeles that was destroyed in the 50s to build Dodger Stadium. It's called Chavez Ravine, the Los Angeles story. Meanwhile, a French company called Ubisoft picks up the rights to the Prince of Persia franchise and calls on their studio in Montreal, Canada to work on reviving the series. In secret, we were already working on very early prototype and first mock-up for the game. Jordan and I met for the first time at E3 2001, and uh, we uh, immediately discussed the idea of making a rebirth for this license. In July 2001, two months after I've met with Jordan, I invited him here to show him what the team have made at that time. And when he saw those mock-ups, those little AVIs we've made, he was totally flabbergasted. And I will 
remember all my life. Jordan's words saying this is reawakening the joy of making video game to me. I think we all saw this as a terrifically exciting opportunity to take something that was so old that we loved and make it new again. We had, you know, the godfather of the license and the action-adventure genre telling us, go ahead. And then we started. After eight months in development, Jordan came in as the official scriptwriter, and he rewrote a new story, totally new, and worked with us till the end. Ubisoft Montreal looks to other games for influences on how to make Sands of Time truly unique. Eco was uh, one of our main influence, and then we had an example of the type of game we were trying to make already. And also, uh, Tony Hawk, Pro Skater, that was another, where you can really, you know, you just play and, and, and try stuff and, and, and be good at it and have really a spectacular uh, character. One feature that truly sets the sands of time apart from other games is the player's control over the flow of time. Wouldn't it be cool if instead of dying, you can turn back time, rewind, and then replay from that point. That way you could play continuously, and only rarely would you die and interrupt the fun of playing. We wanted to have our own technological breakthrough. I could turn back time. Which is all the control time features, the real-time rewind. The prince himself gets an update. We always knew that he was going to be a really agile, acrobatic guy. He's not, like, muscle-bound. He's more the kind of clever trickster. Developing a character who looked at the way that the character felt to play, you know, that was the challenge. He had to have an attitude that would make gamers today really want to be the prince and play in that world. I'm very happy with the design we came up with. As does the gameplay. A lot of 3D games are kind of, they're beautiful, but they're kind of clunky to actually play. So we wanted to have the mechanics and the camera so taken care of that it could become second nature to the player. You could just hit buttons and do a sequence of moves and have this incredible acrobatic thrill of movement. What they really succeeded with with the Sands of Time is creating a very seamless animation that really makes you feel like you're controlling the character. These animations aren't just pre-scripted things, but you're causing this animation to happen. Ubisoft releases Prince of Persia The Sands of Time for the PC, Xbox, PlayStation 2, and GameCube on November 6, 2003. Sands of Time, unfortunately, is one of those games that was a critical success. It had great reviews. It said it was an excellent game, but it didn't really translate into the blockbuster sales that was expected. <laughs> to the point that even a couple months later, Ubisoft bundled Splinter Cell with Prince of Persia. You buy Prince of Persia, and then you get a free Splinter Cell. After a relatively slow start, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, sells more than two million copies worldwide. The way that, the, let's say, the, the gamer have uh, appreciated the game has, has been really, really good for us. We were very surprised, yeah. The Prince has returned, and his new adventures are just beginning. After its 2003 release, Prince of Persia The Sands of Time is showered with praise and sweeps the 2003 AIAS Awards. And the award goes to Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia, Prince of Persia Sands of Time. We received eight prizes. It was a little bit uh, embarrassing after like the fifth when we had to come back all the time on the stage and say so. thank you very much thank you all thank you very much thanks guys thank you again for that award that was beautiful thank you very much winning awards in a in, in a place like dice really goes to show that your peers respect you that people in the industry that you work with really respect what you've done with the game which is i think is a huge honor to have Work on a sequel titled Prince of Persia, Warrior Within begins immediately. When we started the project, uh, we look over Sands of Time. We didn't want it to change everything because the recipe was good in the Sands of Time and improve what can be improved. The team sets out to make a darker, grittier game. 
the prince himself has changed. He's evolved. He's the same character, but he's he's grown up. He has grown up. He's much more mature. And everything around him also has matured. There's a good um, landscapes that you're gonna see in the game. There's no texture. I have to put all the textures, do the modeling, refining, because it's all edgy like this. There is a link in the story between uh, the sands of time and Wario Within. In the first game, he made a little mistake, opening the hard glass. By doing that, he screwed up the timeline. He called upon himself his own incarnation of fate, which is what we call it the Haka, which is based on a true Persian mythology. So this is uh, the Haka, one of our uh, big bosses, and the idea was to give him a, a more of a, a badass walk. I'll go in and add some uh, up and down to give him more bounce because he's such a big guy. Uh, the Haka is the guardian of time. It's a huge beast that cannot be killed. The prince is about this size next to him. The, the Haka's job is to kill the prince. So the sad news is that the prince is going to die. He cannot change his fate. He has to die. So, of course, as a hero, you will try to find a way to change that. The prince's full ID is to rewind time before even the creation of the sense of time. Because no sense of time, no the Haka. And no the Haka. Happy, happy joy. In the game, we're we going to travel through time. This one is uh, like in the present. But now, he can also travel in the past for centuries which enabled us to go a little bit uh, earlier in time so we could visit some different kind of environments. We were going to uh, ancient Persia rather than the Arabic style of the previous game. So this time it's more a mix between uh, Persian and Greek. The highlight of the sequel is an enhanced fighting system. So the freeform fighting system as a gameplay mechanics is basically a mix between the Prince of Persia fighting system and the SSX combo stuff, where you can basically define your own fighting skill. The freeform fighting is just how to make the experience in the combat unique. In the fall of 2004, Ubisoft releases Prince of Persia Warrior Within for the PC and all the major consoles. Meanwhile, Jordan Mechner combines his two greatest passions, games and film. Jerry Bruckheimer and Disney have picked up the rights to make Prince of Persia as a feature film. I'm writing it. Jerry Bruckheimer's producing for Disney. This is a terrifically exciting chance to kind of bring the Prince of Persia full circle to his cinematic roots. As Jordan and the Prince tackle the challenges of the big screen, it's important to recognize how far they have taken the world of gaming. Not only that, but Prince of Persia is also kind of considered one of the first action-adventure games that uh, really spawned a whole bunch of different action-adventure games like Tomb Raider. Prince of Persia was a very uh, important franchise 10 years ago with Jordan Mechner, and we have made a great work uh, with the team. Now that Prince of Persia license is something that we want to push forward for the future. I don't think I could have foreseen that 15 years later, Prince of Persia would still be alive, still be played and remembered. You know, that's probably one of the most rewarding aspects.
king and his son have defeated a mighty empire, inheriting an extravagant hourglass and a mysterious dagger that contain the mystical powers of the sands of time. Inside the hourglass is a marvel that no living man has seen. Only the dagger can unlock the sands of time, and it belongs to a greater one than I. But when the prince is tricked into releasing an ancient and evil curse, you have unleashed the sands of time. I can undo what you have done. Give me the dagger. He'll have to put his faith in a woman he has no reason to trust. My father's army sacked your palace, captured you as a slave. You have every reason to hate me. Now you want me to trust you. Go on! There's no time! Now, he must use his power to control time to get the sands back. The power of revival. The power of delay. The power of restraint. The power of haste. of destiny. From Ubisoft Studios comes the epic tale of a prince searching for redemption and the kingdom he must save. Prince of Persia, the Sands of Time.